Yes, today is Jason Farrell. Jason, how are you? Um, better than I'm better now that I moved to Atlanta. Is it Atlanta nice? Uh, 70 degrees in February. I've never seen anything like it in all my years in Michigan. Oh, it's 72 here in Chicago and sunshine and <laughs> uh, some untruths coming out of my mouth right now. It, it might be. It might be depending on when you actually release this recording. Who knows? It might be. It probably. Uh, it'll probably be even colder when this comes out. <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, we miss you up here in the upper Midwest where it's really cold, <laughs> and uh, we're not seeing folks. So, what are you doing in, in Georgia? What's your uh, What's your job? Um, so I started last year actually thanks to you, Mr. Gerard. You introduced me to my uh, former boss Esteban Garcia, who got me into new signature and their DevOps uh, and, and I'm, intelligence. I'm a big Esteban fan. Esteban's a good guy. Uh, he has since been promoted as we got acquired by Cognizant, and now we're right. the Microsoft Business Group. Our aim is still the same. We help uh, companies adopt DevOps in the cloud um, as part of a, of a rule. And one of our big areas of focus is Kubernetes, which is what I'm going to be here to talk to you about today. Yeah, so let's start. What is Kubernetes? So that is a it, it's a very big question. Um, the best yes. way to put it is uh, when you run containerization, with Docker oh, okay. or some other. Okay, let's, let's back up again. Containerization. Yeah. What is that? Sorry, containerization. So one of the big kind of trends we've seen in technology is where we're seeing companies move away from using virtual machines as part of a scaling strategy for their applications. Instead, they're going to use containers, which are much are smaller process like entities on these machines <clears throat> that allows, allow us to scale up much faster um, in terms of how fast. There's a lot of uh, different criteria, but there was a good uh, uh, publication by the Tinder Engineering Group, and they went from multi-minute startups for their VMs in AWS to sub-30 seconds on their containers. So they're able to account for that scale much faster. Uh, the issue this is... is the, this is the, the Tinder, the swipe left, swipe right? Yes, the dating app. Um, um, a great engineering project, for uh, among other things. But... Uh -huh. um, with but the problem with this approach, though, is that you end up with a lot of containers. Uh, in Tinder's study, I think they had 48,000 containers. And you, simp you wow. simply get to a point where a human can't reasonably manage all that in a, uh, a reasonable fashion. So you need something called an orchestrator. And that's mm -hmm. what Kubernetes is, is a, a orchestrator. There's other ones out there, like MesOS is another uh, competing one, but... Kubernetes has really taken the internet by storm and really kind of cemented itself as the de facto standard. And it's a project, it's actually an open source project from uh, the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, which is part of the Linux Foundation. It was originally created by Google based off their Borg program, which ran their containerization in the early 2000s hmm. before containerization became mainstream. Uh, yeah, early 2000s. I had never heard the word containers in this context that early. Yeah, uh, it's, it's been around for quite a while. So tell, you said it's an orchestrator. Uh, what is an orchestrator? What is, what's the job of an orchestrator? So the orchestrator's job is essentially to maintain, among other things, a desired state. So uh, Dave, let's say you're running a web server, a, a website, and you, and you say to how many machines do you think you should have at a minimum, as an example? I think I need eight machines because eight. it's pretty popular, but not... Eight machines. So what happens if one of those machines goes down? Uh, maybe I could spin up another one. Yep, exactly. You would spin up. In the case of an orchestrator, though, the orchestrator <clears throat> would notice, oh, I only have seven. I need the eighth. And it would automatically spin that up for you in sort of an auto-healing uh, situation. So mm -hmm. that's one of the big advantages of Kubernetes is we can specify a desired state and have the orchestrator automatically maintain that state as best it can. Now, obviously, if we give it bad configuration, invalid uh, container image, or something along those lines, it's going to it won't be able to magically solve all of our problems. But it can run a lot of the day-to-day -day operations of that cluster or that system on its own. What if I need more than eight? What if demand spikes on Tuesday afternoon unexpectedly? Will it help with that? Yes. So 
in, inside of Kubernetes, we have things that are called resources. There are three main ones that we often talk about when we introduce people to Kubernetes. That is um, the service, the pod, and the deployment. But there are other um, resources out there, and one of the ones that would cover the case you're describing would be something known as the horizontal pod autoscaler, where we can specify metrics like CPU that will dictate to the orchestrator, hey, you need to spin up more instances. So you, you can say, I want at least eight, but maybe I want to go as high as 100. OK. And what can I put? what's the criteria I can put in to say when I go from 8 to 10 to 12 to 100? Well, Is by default. based on CPU yeah. usage or something? It's based on CPU usage, actually. Um, I do know that there is a uh, there's a program inside of Kubernetes called the metric server. It's just a, it's a newer thing because there is a weakness with scaling based on CPU percentage, mm -hmm. especially if you're talking about a queue application where <clears throat> your queue tail could be X number long, but your CPU can never spike. In mm -hmm. fact, Microsoft took it upon themselves to address this concern. Again, Kubernetes is open source, and they created the Kada project. K-E-D-A, -E um, and what that is, is a, a custom resource that sits inside of Kubernetes and can scale your pods based on other metrics, such as how many items are in my Azure queue, how mm -hmm. many items are, are, are in my, my Kafka topic, that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. we, you know, the horizontal pod autoscaler is designed to kind of cover those basic cases and there are options out there for other ones, but I love Kada as an external tool if you have like a queue application and all of a sudden you get, you know, a thousand entries, in, entries into your queue. Hmm. Uh, and then uh, there's also uh, plan scalability. Maybe I have an application that every Friday at five o'clock or on the last day of every month, everybody uses my application because it has some sort of payroll or tax implications. Can I, can I, is Kubernetes going to help with that as well? Yes. The horizontal pod auto scales can be uh, scheduled to actually scale up and down based on a schedule. Mm -hmm. I believe. Uh, you look that up. Okay. <laughs> That's always like uh, that. <laughs> uh, what about um, uh, just the configuration itself? Is it is Kubernetes part of the what I configure what my container is actually going to do, or is that something I do separately? So the container is usually the answer to your question is yes and no. So a lot of the times containers are deployed usually as web servers, so they do whatever request comes into that web server. Mm -hmm. However, you can create what are known as jobs or even cron jobs inside of Kubernetes to carry out tasks on a schedule or based on a number of completions. Walk me through the process of using uh, Kubernetes to create and manage a cluster of containers. <laughs> sure, so what you'll, what, you'll, what you'll start off doing is as a developer, we're well, going to have to create your application. And you'll write that in Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, Sublime, and in whatever language you want. There's no restrictions on the languages at all. From that, we'll create a, an image. Usually, it's a Docker image. Could be, um, there's, a, there's other runtimes out there uh, now. Now, now, what is Docker? Docker is a, uh, it's a tool that allows us to containerize workloads. So think of, your, your your a web API from .NET Core, which is that's okay. a, that's an easy one. So you will build the API, you will publish it into its, its DLLs. Those can get moved into a Docker container, a Docker image, and pushed to a re, a Docker registry. Mm -hmm. Registry is nothing more than it's a place where we store images. It's like a it's like a, a code repository for images. Okay. Applications. So then, <clears throat> when we pull those images out using Docker, we can run them as containers. So, okay. the best way that I like to explain how this kind of correlation works if you're familiar with object oriented programming, you're going to create a class. And a class is essentially your image. But then you can instantiate that class any number of times you want. Mm -hmm. Those instantiations would be the containers. Got it. So the image is the blueprint, the directions for creating a uh, container, and the containers are uh, are executions of that blueprint into an actual uh, thing uh, that runs. All right. So each, and then each container will run to completion. So now with a web server, obviously 
it's going to start up and it's going to block. It's going to listen for requests as they come, as they come in. So it would never st stop on its own unless it crashed. But we can also take cont uh, Docker containers and run commands. Um, mm -hmm. A simple example might be your internal OS of the container could be Ubuntu or Linux. And you could run an LS against the current directory on your Windows system. So you could pipe it into the container and do something and come out. So we could run lin lin Linux commands on Windows natively, essentially. So though, but that container would start up, do its thing, and then stop, essentially, because once the container, once that program is done, the container is also done. <clears throat> so that's an important thing to understand because most of the conversation around Docker tends to be with web servers, but it's not okay. just web servers. Anyway, we're so once you have that image created and it's in the registry, now you're going to move to your focus to Kubernetes and say, well, how will I deploy this? Mm -hmm. So if we continue our example <clears throat> with, excuse, excuse me for one second. If we continue our example with the API, effectively, you'll have your image in a registry. You're going to define what's known as a pod. And a pod is the lowest level of resource inside of Kubernetes. It is the pod that carries out the actual task of doing work. Hmm. For the purposes, for in a simpler, in the simplest of sense, a pod can be viewed as the Kubernetes equivalent of a virtual machine. Hmm. They're not the same thing, but they're they're similar enough where you can kind of make that correlation. Within that pod, we're going to define containers. So we're going to say go grab this image and run it as a container inside of this pod. So that could be a web server, it could be a command, it could be whatever you want. So now we have the pod and it's the pod is now running inside of our cluster. Well, we need a way for that, for traffic to get from the outside to our API, which is living in the pod. So we can do that in using a service. And a service would basically say, I, represent these pods and I can actually be a public IP from my cloud provider. Um, so services are basically routers essentially. Mm -hmm. There's another concept called an ingress, which is kind of a higher level, which also allows for effectively L7 routing, which is software-based routing. But uh, services is, is the easiest way to kind of make that connection into the pod. So once you do that, hit the IP, and you're talking to your .NET application the same way you would at localhost. Okay, so uh, Kubernetes not only allows you to manage your containers as they're running, but it also helps you to deploy your containers initially. Yes, correct. So one of the things I didn't mention in that last sequence was the deployment uh, resource, which allows you to basically kind of define that minimum state, but also it takes control of deploying a new version of your application to your pods. Because let's say you had you know, 10,000 pods running, you don't want to delete them all and recreate them. You would have downtime essentially. Mm -hmm. So the deployment can be configured to do different, different kind of types of deployment. By default, it does a rolling deployment. So let's say you have a new version of your, of your API, you've got 80 pods running. It might shut down 10 of those pods um, replace them with 10 more pods that have the new version, and then 10, 10, 10, 10, all the way up to the 80. Mm -hmm. And that's why we, use, why, why we use a service. Because in Kubernetes, that, that number of pods is elastic. We don't know how many we're going to have at a given time. So I can't tell the IP address outside the cluster to, hey, go to this pod, because it may not be there. So we mm -hmm. say, go to the service, and the service says, I represent all 80 pods, I'll figure out which one, which one to send you to that's available. Interesting. Um, now, you mentioned uh, Linux and Ubuntu, and you've mentioned Windows. What's the relationship between Kubernetes and the operating system of choice? Are we limited at all in which operating systems we use? You're not limited from a technical, a technical standpoint. There are Windows containers out there. But what I will say is, while Microsoft has made great strides in reducing the size of Windows for containerization, I believe that the smallest Windows container is still around 800 megabytes, whereas the smallest Linux container is around 20. Um, so it's 
the the tooling around the Linux side of this process is much more mature than on the Windows side, and that's just it's a technical limitation. It's, it's a technical thing that Microsoft is continuously working on, mm-hmm. but there's all there's, there's just Windows is a bigger operating system than Linux is. It's, it's just a it's a it's not a bad thing. It's just it's a it's a fact of life. Okay, and then I I always have a struggle with this because there are a couple of operating systems at work here. For example, there's the base operating system on which you are deploying, and then uh, the, there's the, the 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 containers are running on an operating system as well, right? Is that is that have I have I am I articulating that correctly? Yes, they so Windows container. I always get this backwards. So if you're, I'm sorry <laughs> to anybody who I, if I if I confuse you, Windows containers cannot run on Linux. Okay. But Linux containers can run on Windows. Oh, and okay. I believe it was Kubernetes 1.16 where they allow Kuber, they allow Microsoft, they allow Windows containers to actually run on Kubernetes. It's been very recently um, because it, there's just not a lot of people using them. They're mainly for supporting like .NET framework applications as opposed to .NET Core, which most people will be deploying as Ubuntu or Linux into their containers. They won't be using Windows containers for .NET Core. Because they're smaller and therefore have less overhead. Yeah, well, they're cross-compatible and they're cross-platform. And like I said, Linux is much more mature in this sense than the Windows side of the other coin. Got it. Okay. So when you talk about the maturity of Linux in terms of containers, you're talking about the the operating system on which the <laughs> containers are running, not the operating system down below that right. on which... Um, uh, uh, yeah, the, 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 the Kubernetes is right. Right. Having never set up um, the Kubernetes myself on like a on-prem system, I don't know all the specifics of of that. Um, what I can tell you is, it's it's a question of tooling almost. So getting into the the, the specifics of how Docker kind of takes the, the the processes of Linux, isolates them, and then creates that container-like uh, construct. It just doesn't exist on Windows. They've had to kind of build it in. And mm. Linux was always designed as, as a smaller, more modular operating system than Got Windows. It. That kind of, Windows' modularity came about, I believe, around Vista was when they right. started doing it. But it's not a Windows is bad, Linux is good. It's just Linux has been in this space for five, six years. Windows has been in it for like one to two. Or Got it. Time. Okay, so you bring up a good point that uh, you're not doing much on premises, and I think that's true of most people. When I hear about Kubernetes, I hear about Kubernetes being deployed into a cloud platform. Right. Um, are you are you working mostly with Azure? You said you're a Microsoft partner. Yeah, um, AK, uh, Microsoft AKS. Um, I'm actually Tell me about through, that. Uh, AKS is so I if I were to rank the cloud providers in terms of the Kubernetes that they offer, I would probably put Google at the top. It's their product, after all. Okay. I mean, they, they 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 have some cool things built in, like Istio and Knative. But AKS is right up there. I really like, like AKS a lot. Amazon's a bit more uh, tougher to work with, but we still do them. My main focus is on AKS. It you know it really AKS works. AKS is Azure Kubernetes Ku- Service. Azure Kubernetes Service, yes. So I mean, I would encourage people to spin up a up a cluster on their own and just kind of play with it. Microsoft has really good documentation around it; makes it easy. The one warning I give people is make sure you shut down your, your virtual machine scale sets, which is what they install it on for you at the end of the at the, when you're done, because if you don't, it'll keep running. And, it's, and Kubernetes is very expensive in it, inside of AKS. So make that's sure you're shutting down the machines. Tips. Yeah, make sure you shut down the machines when you're not using them. Yeah, that's the rule of thumb I always use is uh, in the cloud <laughs> where you're renting uh, resources, storage is cheap, compute is expensive. Mm-hmm. That's just yes, a general rule, and of course, uh, Kubernetes running containers, which is compute power. Yep, and and on top of virtual machines too, which is more right. even more expensive. So that's the that's the big piece of advice I give uh, I give people on that. But you know, you can also use things like Minikube or Micro Kate Micro K8. So this is a word you'll hear a lot of people in the Kubernetes space say K8s. It's actually K eight characters then S. Just for Kubernetes, yeah, for, yeah, eight characters. A, <laughs> so if you see K8S, it just means Kubernetes. But there's a Minikube is a good one, and then Micro K8S. That is a one from Ubuntu. What, what do those do? Those are single node uh, Kubernetes clusters that they're really good for like testing out and doing development and, and playing around. Uh, and they won't and they won't cost you anything. Oh, nice. Uh, are those available in Azure? 
Um, those are not you would you would deploy these locally. These are oh, our local. Because I, I will I will share a story with you, Dave. I went to Amazon reInvent a couple years back, and they had an EKS lab, which is Elastic uh, Kubernetes Service, which is Amazon's. And I decided to try it myself when I got back to my uh, my uh, my home in Chicago, and did the whole lab was fun. I thought I shut it down and killed everything. I did not. And Kubernetes showing its awesome ability to self heal, spun itself right back up, unknown to me. Until I got the point, the whole until I got a twenty thousand dollar bill. Oh my gosh! Amazon you waited have to take a second job to pay for that. <laughs> See, I'm mortgage for more than anything, but uh, <laughs> no. Um, but uh, Amazon was very nice. They waived it as long as you shut down and everything. But you know, probably it's, uh, the first person. <laughs> no, I'm not the first person. No, they, they get it all. If the you time. did it twice, it'd probably be less for you. Yeah, they'd be like, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> so that's why I always tell people. Be careful when you're doing this in the cloud because you it can get expensive. I've been caught with things like that. Not to $20,000 expense, but uh, I have been caught with a few things where I left them running and just was surprised by the bill at the end of the month. Yeah. Um, is there anything we haven't talked about that we should have? Um, I think the only other thing I would want to talk about is there's a great website called, um, well, first of all, the Kubernetes documentation, kubernetes.io is fantastic. Yeah. Check it out. They'll walk you through everything. Um, Really good stuff. The other one is if you ever, so Kubernetes has kind of become its own ecosystem, more or less. Mm -hmm. And that ecosystem is managed by the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, the CNCF, we call it. If you go to cncf.io, there's actually a, a landscape that they keep up to date with all the projects that are currently actively going on that are in that Kubernetes space. And I want to say it's close to two or 300 at, at the present time. It's a lot. And nice. Look at it right now. And they, uh, the nice thing is that they'll actually break it down by certain areas. So if you want a CI CD pipeline for Kubernetes, here's a, here's all the projects for it. If you want um, uh, security and monitoring, here's all the tools for that. Like Pro Prometheus is the big one there. It's yeah, they have everything there. The ecosystem has really, really exploded, and just the number of tooling is off the chart. It's kind of crazy. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, so the best place to go for getting started is kubernetes.io. Is that yep. a good starting point? That's a good Anywhere starting else? point. Anywhere else? Any other references you can share? Uh, there's some good YouTube videos out there. There's a lot of getting started videos. Uh, the big thing, you know, I just did a, a, a week-long workshop with a, a client last week, getting them started. And they came to me at the end. They said, you know, we were really scared of Kubernetes. We're amazed at how easy it actually is. Well, you, know, you did your job. I think it's, you know, well, I think it's got a lot of notoriety that's super hard, but really once you kind of get past some of the, that, that first wave, mm -hmm. it makes a lot of sense. All you're doing is deploying pods in, into this cluster. Um, as you get more sophisticated, it gets tricky, but that's the same with anything. Well, Jason, I appreciate your time. It's been educational. I appreciate and you having me on, Dave. Thank you. You please stay safe. I'll try my best. I'm very grateful for technology as it has helped me make some of the best friends in my life. And the use of technology has also helped me maintain closeness with my friends and family as we go through the isolation uh, related to COVID and the pandemic.